Recently, I finally worked up the courage to tell one of my friends about this whole YouTube thing, and the first thing that they told me was that I needed to cover off. Now here's the thing, I know absolutely nothing about off. Even the internet is weirdly cryptic about anything outside of spoiler territory. I know it's an RPG with horror elements made in RPG Maker 2003, I know it's a French game created by a Belgian team, and I know it's developed a monumental cult following. The only basic synopsis I could find was on IMDB, of all places. In Off, you take control of a mysterious person called the Batter. The Batter, and yourself as his controller, are dropped off in Zone Zero, in an unknown world about which you slowly find out more and more in the process of the game. That description was almost entirely fluff. I play as someone called the Batter, and I'm in Zone Zero. That's it. The rest of that was basically just play the game and find out more, but with extra words. I'm honestly excited to go into a game this blind. It's clearly labeled as being at least partially a mystery, which may explain the lack of detailed information. Since that's all I could find, I guess we just have to hop in. Caution, it is possible that certain scenes in this game may prove shocking to an unwarned public. Or maybe not. Well, that's not concerning at all. The game asks for your name, gender, and then informs you that you have been assigned to a being known as the Batter. Apparently he's on a mission, and we're in charge of making sure that it is accomplished. It unfortunately does not elaborate on what the mission itself is, dropping you off in a location called Zone Zero, and telling you to locate someone named The Judge if you want more information. I'm starting to understand why the synopses were so bare bones. Zone Zero is a small yellow island surrounded by a white sea. The only notable structure is a large tower with a ladder leading to the top. You quickly encounter a cat with remarkable oral hygiene who claims that there cannot be any living beings in Zone Zero, proclaiming that we are figments of his imagination. Nevertheless, he introduces himself as the Judge. The Batter introduces himself, stating that he's been entrusted with a sacred mission. Unfortunately, the Judge wasn't talking to the Batter, he was talking to you. This game breaks the fourth wall fairly frequently, but lots of it is subtle and it never gets old or overused. The batter answers for you, giving the judge your name and explaining that you seem unable to speak but can see and hear all. The batter asks for help. His sacred mission is to purify the world. The judge offers to act as our guide, hopping up the tower. As we continue to interact, the judge begins to realize that you and the batter are both alive. He lets you know that you will likely encounter hostile foes as you visit the other zones, offering to teach you to fight. Every time you experience a combat encounter, it begins with the line, Purification in Progress, and ends with the line, Adversaries Purified, which is insanely off-putting. The combat is relatively simple, but I'm not much of a fan, honestly. You have three options during combat, attack, competence, and objects. Attack is a basic physical attack, and objects allows you to use items. Competence is this game's version of special skills, with each ability costing CP. There's also a bar underneath your CP counter that fills over time. When the bar is full, you can take any action, then the bar will be reset to the bottom. This forces you to take a more active approach in RPG fighting, since it will no longer count as turn-based combat. The enemy won't wait for you while you formulate a strategy, you need to think on the fly. The reason I'm not too big on the combat is mainly due to the visuals. Every fight looks the same, with no interesting animations for your unique abilities. The player and the enemies are all black and white with a colored background, which contrasts well. Unfortunately, the effects of being black and white makes them blend into the enemies instead of popping. The system isn't bad by any means, it just made each fight feel like it was dragging on. After learning the basics of combat, you are introduced to the second most prominent part of the game, puzzles. These early ones are pretty simple, just press the buttons in the order seen on the wall. I would highly recommend having a writing utensil on hand for some of these because they require a lot of memorization. After the tutorial puzzles, we are released into the world map at last, or at least I guess it's a world map? The game itself doesn't seem so sure. This location is comprised of muddy greens and blacks with red dots indicating the places that you can go. It looks like there are three more zones alongside a room we can't access yet, literally called The Room. For now, let's head to Zone 1. There are living beings here as well as a tramway used for navigating the zone. You arrive at the smoke mines and the batter explains to a miner that he is here to get rid of impure spirits. In the smoke mines, miners unearth metal to free trapped smoke from the depths. They then bottle said smoke which is sent to the other zones by someone named the Queen. The remaining smoke forms the air that the beings here breathe. It's an essential element, one of four. The mines are full of specters that are growing increasingly aggressive and it's your job to purify it. You once again meet the judge. He shows you something called an add-on, a spiritual entity that you can bind to the batter. 
This add-on, Alpha, functions as an additional party member. However, the leader of the Spectres is nowhere to be seen. The miner from earlier leads us to the main mines. The batter calls out to the Spectres, with a whopping eight of them appearing. Fortunately, with the help of Alpha, they go down easily. The mines are a maze, but you quickly find the end of this section and are stopped by a farmer asking you to purify the Spectres in the nearby cow sheds. Here, farmers cut cows in half to extract the metallic rocks inside. The poor quality metal turns into soil for the ground, while the rest is purified to make other objects. This is also distributed to the the other zones by the queen. This metal is another essential element next to smoke. It seems the people in this world need to create a lot of things that we would find normally outside. Bat in hand, the batter quickly pulverizes the specters into a fine mist. Before you can leave, a terrifying looking man insults one of the townsfolk for letting you in. He claims the batter will die, as nobody but the queen's officers can beat the specters. He leaves you to talk to the townsperson. They claim that his name is Deaden and that he's the queen's inspector. The batter states that Deaden is evil and that he must be destroyed. We admire some of the previously aforementioned bisected cows and head back into the mines for some more purification. This time, the mines are even harder to navigate due to the lack of a light source. It takes some time, but you and the batter locate a room with a man where what looks like a frog mask? This is Zachary, the traditional items merchant that's necessary to every video game. How meta of him. You get some new equipment before continuing forward to the plastic administrations. The workers fill in forms, package them, wrap them, and send them to be shipped off in exchange for more plastic. Liquid plastic makes up the lakes and oceans, while solid plastic is used for various objects, similar to metal. As you probably guessed, plastic is the third essential element. A man from the plastic administrations tell you that the specters come from the postal service. The elevator behind him requires a code to visit certain floors. We can visit the ground floor and the roof, but the postal service code is unknown. On the roof, you see the judge again claiming that one of the rooms on the ground floor holds the code for the postal service. He also tells us to favor lowercase over uppercase. On the ground floor, there are four rooms bustling with employees rattling off random numbers. The people on the bottom left say the same numbers every time. Since there are two strings of numbers, you favor the one behind the word starting with a lowercase letter. This code gets you to the postal service. The postal service is full of pieces of paper with a poorly hidden code. Once you deliver this code to the person on the top floor of the department, they freak out and a battle begins. They quickly fall at the batter's hand and you walk in on Deaden. He is very clear that the next time he sees you, you die. You take the tram to the next area, answering a citizen's questions using information on the posters to their right in order to pass. You are now in the meat fountains where meat flows freely filling metal pools. The workers pour the meat into bottles, making sure the fountains don't overflow before the meat is distributed to the other zones. This is the final of the four essential elements, although the order seems somewhat ambiguous. Everyone you talk to to learn about these elements claim that the element they focus on is the first of the four. The worker asks who you are, with the batter proclaiming that he is here to liberate the world of malignants. The worker asks if he can be liberated, and the batter complies. You head north and greet Zachary once again before tearing down a resident standing in the way of your next puzzle. It's a relatively simple one. You take a pedalo and use it to navigate the waters, marking down the numbers on the walls as you go. This lets you into the building, where you quickly realize many of the paths lead straight back to the start. I initially thought that this could be solved by trial and error, but the further I got, the more confusing the hulls seemed until I just accidentally stumbled into the correct area. It doesn't help that your movement is almost slippery, causing you to overshoot your mark frequently. Here you find Deaden, initiating your first boss fight. The boss fights in off are really easy. You can win by just using your basic attack over and over and using the batter's healing competence if anyone gets low on health. Deaden? More like deaden. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. The batter states that the land is now pure, returning to the homeworld. But first, you see a young child sitting in a room alone. They seem distressed at the loss of Deaden. But for now, it's time to move to the next zone. Zone 2 is separated into five segments, north, east, south, west, and a library in the center. The library receptionist mentions that someone has been tearing pages out of many of the books. Fortunately, each book has a faded playing card imprinted upon it, so all you need to do is match them up to repair each book. Unfortunately, you don't have all the pages, but this can be rectified by purchasing the last one off a man to the west. As you climb further, you come across a somewhat familiar cat, although this one isn't the judge. 
He claims to be named Jafet, the leader of the Phantoms. You beat him up, but he teleports away, leaving behind another add-on, Omega. The judge is waiting for you outside the library to tell you that a nearby shopping mall has been attacked by specters. You fight your way to the end, finding the judge, who asks you to keep an eye out for his brother, Valerie, who has lived in this zone for quite some time. You also find a switch that summons another pedalo to the east. You use the pedalo to travel to the park, an area cut off by the ocean. The park isn't a traditional one, though. It's an amusement park. After finishing a frustrating trial and error boating puzzle, you locate the weapon for your add-ons and activate a switch. This puzzle is the worst. You have to dodge motors under the water that push your boat forwards. They're really easy to see in the first room, but you have to strain your eyes for the second room. Plus, the biggest prize can only be accessed by hitting a specific motor that looks like it would push you forwards just like any other one. Having to restart if you lose control once is the worst. Moving on from that nightmare, you head to the roller coaster, riding with a statue of Zachary who supposedly built this place. You take your complimentary photo and head north to play a balloon-based game. The person running it gets very mad when you win, so you purify him and earn a tie. You return from the park and head to a nearby town where people only seem to trust you if you have a tie. Throwing on your prize, you head inside only to find Jafet, sicking a swarm of specters on the townspeople. You only have four minutes to purify them all, which is more than doable. After saving them, the townspeople promptly kick you out and take your tie. That bat is dangerous, after all. The judge returns with the unfortunate news that his brother is pretending to be called Jafet and that he is hiding on the roof of the library. You, the batter, and the judge confront Valerie, who has been taken over by a bird, the true Jafet. This does not prevent the purification. After your victory, the child from earlier appears in another cutscene, visibly worried that the bird is now gone. This time in my playthrough, I decided to revisit the previous zones to make sure I didn't miss anything. However, they look quite different now. They're devoid of color. Empty. The only beings here are horrifically mutated creatures called secretaries, and they're incredibly hostile. Maybe these zones aren't as purified as we thought. At the end of Zone 1 and 2, you find items called the Grand Finale and the Grand Diagonal, which will be helpful later on. For now, I think it's time we move to the final zone, Zone 3. This zone is very industrial, with the main visual being a factory. There's a monorail beneath it that can transport you around the map, although most of the areas are blocked off. For now, you head upwards and find a room covered in boxes. If you step on the wrong one, an enemy in need of purification is summoned and you are removed from the building. Using a stamped paper as a guide, you navigate the room. Zachary is nearby, wearing a new mask and pretending to be the judge. I like this mask a lot more than the previous one. In the room to the left, you find yet another add-on, Epsilon. There are some simple switch-based puzzles in the factory section of the building. At the top, you find three workers in a room full of specters. The workers don't want anyone getting to the piles of sugar nearby, and we witness the first time any normal workers have managed to defeat a specter. Unfortunately, they think that you want their sugar too, and therefore they must be purified. Zach arrives in the room, confused as to why there's sugar in a place like this. He warns us that the factory workers seem to be in a bad mood, and he isn't lying. You and the batter get to work. You take the monorail to the next area. Area, climbing a chimney and participating in a minigame as you fall to the ground. The goal is to fall through the center of the add-ons while dodging the specters, but it's insanely clunky and a pain to work with. I eventually got a feel for it right before the timer ran out, but it was closer than I would have liked. At the bottom, you meet more sugar-obsessed workers. Apparently, we are in the sugar ovens of Vesper, where the vapors from burning corpses are turned into sugar. It is washed and purified in the treatment rooms before being distributed to the workers as payment for the day. It is a secret fifth essential element. You are told that the person behind this operation is in the fourth and final section of Zone 3. You jump in the sugar pipe and meet with Zachary before heading off to Zone 4 using an access card that he provides. On an unrelated note, the batter's head blends into the door here and makes it look like he's wearing an absurdly tall top hat. It's unimportant, but I think it's funny. The monorail comes to a halt due to a track obstruction. When you leave to go clear it, you find a hostile citizen in need of purification. Now that the tracks are unobscured, you explore the halls of your destination. They're full of hostiles in need of purification, who all go down easy. You locate a music box, then stumble upon Zachary, who offers to give you a hint in exchange for it. You comply with the merchant telling you to look more closely at the README file in the game's folder. What? Upon closer inspection of the Frequently Asked Questions section, you find a code that can be entered in a nearby room with a game controller. This grants you access to the lower levels, where you locate a very large man with a wide grin. His name is Enoch, and he reveals that the specters that you've been purifying are the souls of the dead. Nevertheless, it's time for his purification. Unfortunately, he doesn't seem to be going down. 
No matter how much damage you do, you physically cannot win. The batter recommends that you run, which you reluctantly have to do. Enoch isn't interested in taking no for an answer, chasing you down the corridor and reinitiating the fight if he catches you. You manage to escape and run to the monorail, only for Enoch to rise from below several times larger than before. The batter notes that Enoch has tired himself out before the true fight could even begin, making his purification all the easier. You immediately return to the purified version of the zone, collecting the Grand Spectral. The room in the world map that was previously locked is now available to enter. Welcome to the endgame. The place known only as The Room has almost no color. Rows of chairs sit in a corner next to the door to a bedroom containing only a bed and a poster with the date. Upon exiting, the chairs have rearranged themselves into a smile. Every time you return to the hallway, the contents of the room change. First, there's a note on the wall next to the poster. Next, you have an army of enemies to purify. Now, the bedroom contains a doorway to a sketchy hall full of sketchy specters. It contains nothing of use. As you leave, you are teleported back to the entrance to begin another loop. The chair room is now full of boxes, while the bedroom has a stuffed animal. The previously useless doorway leads to a map page with four locations, one leading to a tall mister, one leading to a bird, one leading to a big mister, and one leading to mama. However, you cannot visit mama. The tall mister wishes to know the time, and the big mister wishes to be released from his hole in the ground. These seem to be nicer, less vulgar versions of the Zone Guardians. Maybe past versions, since you're presumably seeing the memories of the child from the cutscenes? Their names here are full of a youthful innocence, and we don't see any other children here in the game. You bring the poster with the date to the tall mister who gives you a book. You then give the book to the bird who agrees to help release the big mister. Only then may you visit Mama. The screen is black. A child talks about making three friends today. The tall mister, the bird, and the big mister. As they describe each friend, a white circle appears on screen. An add-on, one for each. Were the guardians related to the add-ons? The child remarks that he wishes for his mother to come back soon before you and the batter are sent to start another loop. In this loop, the world is upside down. As you navigate the only hall, you cannot use the door at the end, returning to the spawn room that takes you to a fake title screen with three mysterious saves. I guess let's use one. The halls are different now. There are residents asking different questions about your journey, like dates and location names. Each reward you with a strong item. At the south end, you meet a large man. He tells you to enter a random number, but something tells me that he already has one in mind. You start the loop again, choosing a different save this time. This one is full of constantly whispering shadows. There's a room with a button puzzle that reveals another number to give to the large man. Giving the code to the man earns you another item. You head back to the upside down room, but this time you can enter the final door. There was a code in the previous room that didn't work when you gave it to the large man, so you use it here, starting the next loop. In this one, an old comic lies in the bedroom. It takes you to a simple minigame where you walk to the right while dodging enemies. You can fight and purify them all if you have the time for that, but I'd rather move on and try to finally get some answers. The batter leaves, ending this loop. Zachary appears in his frog mask once again, telling you that this save point is your last. Up ahead, you meet the Queen. The batter confronts her. She's been waiting for him. He explains that he got rid of the Guardians, which shocks her. She asks why he destroyed her kingdom, with the batter claiming that her role was to take care of him, and that she failed the task. The him in question is probably in reference to that child that has been such a major focus of the room. The Queen claims that she built all of this for her children, and she wants nothing more than their happiness. She promises that she will never let the batter hurt the son that brought them into this world. Wait, what? Did this kid create the queen and the batter? And if he created the queen that created the world, did he create everything? They begin to fight. She has add-ons too, but they don't add much trouble. During the fight, the queen taunts the batter. You don't even know his first name. However, this is not enough to save her. As the queen falls, she starts speaking to the batter as if he's part of the family, calling him her love and remarking, look, he has your eyes. The batter moves forth towards the same red room the child has been in all this time during the cutscenes. Despite the fact that this is only a child, you cannot progress until he's purified. The room turns white and a door is revealed. 
You enter, revealing a hallway with a switch at the end. But before you can do anything, the judge appears. He shuns you, asking what you've done. Not the batter, you. Is continuing the narrative really your excuse for killing a woman and child? You haven't purified this place, you've destroyed it. There's nothing left. The judge offers you a choice. Join the batter and complete the mission, or join the judge and stop the batter. It is clearly stated that siding with the batter is the official ending, but I frankly don't care. We just watched this man murder a child, and there's no way in hell I'm siding with him. You and the judge destroy the batter. With the judge's powerful competences, it's child's play. The credits roll as the judge wanders through the purified world. No living creatures in sight. That design for the batter was so cool. I liked that he looked like a horrific monster, just like what happened to the townsfolk from the previous battles. I'm still fairly confused on the child, Hugo, and his relationship to the batter and the queen. They imply that he is both their creator and their child, like he manifested parents with his imagination. But for right now, that's unimportant, because we need to see the official ending. This time, you and the batter easily defeat the judge. You move to the switch on the wall and flick it. The switch is now off. This time, the credits are pure black. I love the reveal of the title's purpose here, the switch being turned off. It really throws an extra emotional impact right at the last second. I always love a game where you play as a villain, and the game has always been pushing the vibe that something is very wrong. The batter seems too cold about murdering people, but it's the only way to progress. It reminds me of what Undertale expanded upon in 2015. Now there's actually one extra ending you can get. To do it, you need to buy the Grand Break Yield from Zachary next to the final save. Then, retreat to Zone Zero and visit the room with the very first code. This time, there are stairs. They lead to a vault full of sugar, with a woman sitting in the corner spouting nonsense. A fight begins and the batter effortlessly defeats her, earning a Grand Chocolatier. Upon dying, she asks us to tell Zachary goodbye. What connection do they have to one another? Two very mysterious characters. Zachary seems distraught, but still offers to give you a special item in exchange for the five grand items. You can either choose a weapon or an Ares card. You need to take the card. This secret ending is identical to the official ending with a post-credits cutscene added onto the end. I'm personally hoping it'll shed some more light on Zachary. He's one of the most mysterious characters in the game, and I find him endlessly fascinating. Let's take a look at the cutscene. I... wow. I know it says true ending and all, but all accounts say that it's just a joke, which I'm inclined to believe after that happened. So that was off. Honestly, I loved it. I know I drew a connection to Undertale earlier, but upon further research, Off was definitely an inspiration for it. I don't properly know how to describe the vibe it gives off as you progress, with things feeling more and more, well, off as you go on. The term purification replacing the concept of murder is so clinical and heartless, it's perfect for the tone. It had some great puzzles, although you definitely need a notepad and wonderful art and designs. Plus, with the story being as ambiguous as it is, there's definitely a lot of room to theorize for years to come. I can absolutely see why this became a cult hit, and now I finally know who the heck that character in the cat mask is. I hope to see you all again. Have a great rest of your day.